Open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians 13. Part of our series, you know, we're doing our series on Christianity 101. And remember, the foundation for that is people make this statement, all religions are fundamentally the same. And we say they are, except for what they teach about sin, salvation, heaven, hell, the nature of God, the nature of man, nature of members of the church. Other than that, they're exactly the same. And so we went through those foundational doctrines, and now we're getting into some nuts and bolts Christian behavior, how do we interact? And there's nothing more fundamental to the church than marriage, right? So the Bible says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We're not going to be in Ephesians 5 today, but if we were, you can't tell where he's talking about the church or where he's talking about marriage. Because the church is made up of homes, and homes are to be made up of Christians, And the way that we interact is so important. And the the foundational unit to society is the home and the family. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And remember a few weeks ago, we studied what does the word charity mean? What What is charity? So 1 Corinthians 13. And so hold your place in 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to define, we're going to redefine just here in the first couple of minutes what charity is, and then we're going to apply it to the home. So, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's just noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity... I'm nothing. So all this stuff about spiritual gifts, and you might be the most spiritual person in the world, but if you don't have charity, then then you're nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So what we see in verse 3 is that the standard definition of charity, giving your goods to feed the poor, is a false definition. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Isn't that, to me, that, that just shocks me every time I read it. That the worldly understanding of charity is just the opposite of biblical charity. Then verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So let's just briefly redefine what charity is. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians 13. Go to 1 Corinthians 8. Look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, as touching things offered to idols, so this is food offered to idols, whether or not you're supposed to eat it, we uh, we know that we have all knowledge, so we know everything we need to know about that. But look at what he says. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Charity edifieth. So the best definition of charity is love that gives. It's love that gives. And this edification, so that's the definition, edification, it's love invested for the purpose of building. Love invested for the purpose of building. So imagine that in your home, where the husband is investing his love in her for the purpose of building her up, where she is investing her love in him for the purpose of building him up. That's the first definition of love. Go back to... Of charity. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Charity also eliminates boasting. It eliminates boasting. Look at what it says in verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Look at verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. 
uh, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So what is this? This is love given with nothing expected in return. That's, that's charity. It's love given with nothing expected in return. She doesn't treat me right, so I'm not going to treat her right. That's the opposite of biblical charity. And if we as married couples would behave ourselves with charity, where I invest in her expecting nothing in return, where she invests in him expecting nothing in return, that's biblical charity. How many of you can think that already our marriages would be better if everything we did was invest in her to build her up? Everything we do is invest in her expecting nothing in return. Everything you ladies do is invest in him in order to build him up. You know, you husbands and wives, you ought to feel the best about yourselves when you're with the other person. Right? And you want to be that person for them. Not only that, but... Charity endures beyond human capacity. So look at what it says in verse 7. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. That's all things that God has done. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. So what is this? This is love that endures Beyond human capacity. It's love that endures. You, Pastor, you don't understand what's going on in our marriage. You don't understand how bad it is. I promise you this. Biblical charity can overcome it. Biblical charity can overcome it. So when we understand the way that charity is supposed to function in the marriage, charity is love invested for the purpose of edification, for building them up. This is devotion. It, it is love invested, expecting nothing in return. That's godly. And then it's love invested beyond human capacity. This is divine. There, you can't do that. Only God can bring that to the home. That's what charity is supposed to be. Now go with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Can you see that right there? You ladies might want to mark your own. You know, there's this idea that if you submit to your husband, that means that you submit to every man in the world. That's not what the Bible says. Submit to your own husband. Right? So th that's what the text says. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, this is talking about the husband, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So I think in general, ladies are more spiritual than men. And in a lot of situations, the man is not that interested in church. Now, there are reasons for that. You know, the, the Tim Hawkins thing about going to church and holding hands, you know, to sing a song. And they say, I want to touch your face. You know, these songs, these Christian songs, and Hawkins is there saying, I love Jesus. I don't want to touch his face. You know, how many of you guys, you ever been in a, in a religious thing where they all want to hold hands? How many of you have been there, right? How many of you men absolutely despise that? Would you raise your hands? Look around, everybody. What the heck? And so some of the reasons that men don't want to be involved in church is because you have feminine churches. They need man camp. Amen, guys? There's no dude that wants to hold another dude's hand unless there are some serious issues. Right? I don't, wanna, I don't walk down the street holding Jacob's hand. That's my son if you're not here. He'd look at me like, what are you doing? So there's these issues that take place in church, but generally speaking, women, because they're more intuitive and, and more spiritual creatures, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, by nature, are more spiritual. God understands that. And so you'll have a man that's not doing right, and the best way for his wife to win him to the Lord, or if he's a believer, to get him back serving God, is to just be a godly Wife, you're not going to talk him into it. I've got something on that. I'll just read it right now. 
This is fantastic. So Baptist Voice, this is out of uh, Lancaster Baptist Church. R.B. Willette wrote in this. He's a pastor, just retired from his church in Michigan. But he said this. So marriage advice. Um, this, is, this is amazing. Women have their own expectations to improve their husbands. Their tendency to want to redecorate the house and add certain touches to meals carries over to relationship with their husband. She may give small advice on how to drive, how to dress, and generally mother him. That never happens in any of your houses, does it? Listen to this statement. One of the big complaints that women have in marriage is the lack of romance. Okay? Listen to this statement. I'll read this whole thing again. It says, She may give small advice on how to drive, how to dress, and generally mother him. But stable men don't feel romantically inclined toward their mothers. That's one of the best things I've ever read. It is so true. And don't worry, guys, you're going to get it here in a minute. But that idea of winning your husband silently, it's so important. It's so vital to this conversation. Look at verse 2. While they, be, while they behold your chaste conversation... Coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair or, and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be in the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. You know, the, the caricature of a nagging woman. Every man hates that. I've told you every time if you had cleared off the snow, we'd be on time for church. <laughs> you never take out the trash. Our, our, our garage is full of garbage. You never take out the trash. Are you going to take it out today? Now, guys, honestly, often you've driven her to it. Let's be honest, right? But it still doesn't work. Are you all following me on this? It's so interesting. Is that the opposite of a meek and quiet spirit? And here's what some of you ladies are saying. I want to kill him. That's why it's got to be divine. That's why it has to be a spiritual discipline. It has to be a spiritual thing. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, so the inward part of your heart. And God says that, that meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God is of great price. After this manner also, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. All right, so th I'm going to talk about that in a minute, that the way that Sarah showed respect to Abraham when he certainly did not deserve it, he didn't remember he said, "Here, tell tell this guy that you're my sister in case he wants to take you so he doesn't hurt me." That's what Abraham said. And yet she still showed him respect. Did he deserve respect? No, I'd want to punch him in the face. And yet she still showed him reverence. There's a reason for that. Then look at what it says. Likewise, verse 7, ye husbands Dwell with them, who's that, your wife, according to knowledge. It's amazing how stupid men are about women. And all the ladies said, 
It's so true. And that's why God tells men, don't be stupid. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Now, how about that? That the understanding of the Christian home that the, that the modern Marxist feminist women put forward is a woman that's abused and demeaned. No, the Bible says give her honor. Is that the opposite of abuse and demeaning? Yes. Right? So, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. What does that mean, as unto the weaker vessel? So, my mother was a very strong woman. So, what is this talking about? Many of you ladies here, you're very strong women. It's not saying that you're not strong. But in the areas that the Bible is addressing, the man is stronger. That's what it's saying here. And so, what men have to understand is there are things that will damage your relationship with your wife or damage the peacefulness of your home if you're not caring for them. It's your job. And just as far as the weaker vessel, men are stronger than women. Men are stronger than women. That's just, you know, I'm looking over here at, at Chris and Heather Branham. All right, so I'm looking at them. Which one's stronger? Come on. So this idea that there's no difference between men and women, you've got to take your brain out and play with it to think like that. You just do. And here's what happens. You have brothers and sisters, especially if it's an older sister. She beats up her brother. It always happens until she doesn't. It ends. So you girls, do it while you can. That's all I can say. Do it while you can. Because it'll change. So if you take a thousand women, so you take a thousand women and have them throw a fastball. And just any man and have him throw a fastball. He'll throw faster than all of them except one. I'm not talking about a major league pitcher. I'm talking about any dude. Men are stronger than women. And here's what some of you are thinking. But you don't know my friend Inga. <laughs> and if you know an Inga, you know what I'm talking about? There are exceptions, you know, but for every Inga, there's a Hans. You know what I mean? These giants that walk in the room, and, you know, because somebody has to be able to handle Inga. And so, <laughs> you have... Men are just stronger than women. That's all there is to it. And women are more intuitive than men. What does that mean? That it's much easier to hurt a woman's feelings than it is to hurt a man's feelings. If you say that, so if I said to Luke, Luke, I don't like that shirt. Okay, <laughs> fine, <laughs> whatever. But if I said that to a lady, you know, I don't like your dress. It depends on the lady, of course. But in general, it's going to be received differently. Is that fair? That's fair. And so, we men are supposed to live with our wives according to knowledge, knowing that some of my um, brutishness, not physical brutishness, my, the brutishness of my thinking will hurt her. And sometimes there are wounds in a relationship because men, they refuse to dwell with their wives according to knowledge. That hurts her. Don't do that. Right? So that's the, likewise ye husbands, verse 7, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs, what's that say? Together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love the brethren, be pitiful, have pity, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, 
but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. So it's so important that we get this. If you'll take those verses 8 through 10 and apply it to your home, everything will change. So now let's get into some things. I just want, I've got three points in my sermon. I wanted to go through those texts and talk about it. And those basic things, I want us to apply some of those together. Um, Brother Willette in this article, he makes this point, which is really interesting. <clears throat> he says that, that men and women think different. From the very early stages of development, the brains of men and women develop differently. Now, how many of you had to be told that? Right? Um, and this is based on scientific research. Weeks after, let, let's see, uh, women get a heavy dose of, dose of estrogen, which develops a more nurturing and caring nature. Weeks after conception, men receive a huge dose, dose of testosterone and later a biochemical bath that severs much of the connection between the left and right brain. This promotes competitiveness and focus at the cost of multitasking. Man, there's a great... Here's the picture. This is the picture. Thanksgiving dinner. Whole families together. Right? You sit, you eat. After dinner, all the women go into the kitchen or wherever they're going to be, and they all talk at the same time. <laughs> and they're all hearing each other. Guys go and throw a football. Guys go out and look at the tractor. They go out and look at the car. They go to sleep. Is this the picture? Is this accurate? Is this the picture? And all the guys are together, and there's almost no talking. Mainly because you don't like your brother-in-law. But you're all together. You're either doing something athletic or something technical, or you're watching something competitive. That's what's going on. Why? We're different. We're different. Um, he says this, The result is a very different way of thinking for men and women. Men are analytical with a laser-like focus. Ladies, are you listening to me? How many times have you ever said that to your husband? He's thinking about something else, and he can't think about what you're saying and what he's thinking about at the same time. The result is a very different way of thinking for men and women. Men are analytical with a laser-like focus, while women are much more intuitive and are able to juggle many tasks at the same time. There are obvious advantages and disadvantages to both. A man can usually tell you exactly why he believes something. If he doesn't trust someone, he would tell you he caught the person in a lie or saw him keeping back money that wasn't his. In math terms, he can show his work. He may still be wrong, but he can give you good reasons for being wrong. Women don't show their work. Remember the Dick Van Dyke show? She's mad at him. What's going If you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. And he's completely flummoxed. Women don't show their work, but often come to the right conclusion by intuition, their brain working faster than they can explain. To see the difference in focus, watch one spouse have a phone conversation while the other is listening. The wife is perfectly capable of talking to one person on the phone and getting feedback from her husband next to her. The husband cannot. If his wife asks him to ask a question, he has to put the person on hold, turn to his wife, and ask, what do you want me to ask him? I can't talk to him and you at the same time. What are you doing? Men and women are different. They think differently. They interact differently. They have different expectations. They want to be treated one way and not another. This was such an interesting thing. After reading the differences between how men and women think and feel, you can almost see the conflict coming. The different thinking patterns and behaviors are ripe for misunderstandings and unmet expectations. This right here was... So the, the beginning of it, that men want to fix things and women want to have conversation. We know that, right? But listen to how he says, he, he, he adds another layer to it that really helped me to understand. 
Primarily, men want to fix problems. Women want to affirm people. When the wife shares a problem, the husband assumes she is telling him because she wants him to fix the problem. That's why he would share the problem. Right? So if there's an issue with the headlight on Laura's car, I go to Travis and I say, Hey, Travis, I've got this headlight that's not working right. It's been like that for six months. I'm the worst husband in the world. And so I ask him, He's not asking me. I'm not telling him because I want him to know how I feel about the headlight. I want him to tell me how to fix it. That's the way we think, right? So when the wife shares a problem, the husband assumes she is telling him because she wants him to fix the problem. That's why he would share the problem. Really, she just wants sympathy and encouragement And she will prolong the conversation until she gets it. Guys, have you ever been in that conversation? And you're saying, how long are we going to talk about this? Listen. She will prolong the conversation until she gets that sympathy or understanding. It's not even a conscious decision but she may reject her husband's solutions. Listen, so he has the right solution to the problem sometimes? Listen, she may reject her husband's solutions because she isn't done talking about it yet. (laughs) Because, ladies, you just feel better talking about it. Right? And the husband wants to go eat something. So this is so interesting. If this continues, the wife subcon if this continues, the wife subconsciously rejecting solutions to continue the conversation, the husband ends up feeling rejected and the wife does not find the reassurance for which she was looking. It's a lose-lose because the husband's not hearing what she wants and the wife isn't receiving the help that he's dying to give her. Do you see how our problems are? Because we think differently. So what are we going to do? Let's get some fundamentals. Um, Fundamentals. Who am I supposed to be? Not who is my wife supposed to be, or who is the husband supposed to be. Who am I supposed to be? Notice, it's not who my spouse is supposed to be. It's who I am supposed to be. The, The problem in your marriage is not the other person. The problem is you. Now, let me stop. Sometimes you're married to an idiot. You know, ladies, you're married to a guy that wants to fool around and leave. If he's gone, your behavior isn't going to bring him back. He's gone. Uh, If you have a lady that doesn't want to be a wife and mother and wants to live like the devil, there's nothing that you can do about that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about two married people who love the Lord trying to keep this marriage together. How many recognize that people can walk away from the Lord and there's nothing you can do about it? Right? There's nothing. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, in in a Christian home, the problem is not her. It's you, men. In a Christian home, ladies, the problem is not your husband. The problem is you. And if we will take responsibility and, and allow the Holy Spirit of God to change us, the marriage will get better. All right? So, uh, husbands, this is what a wife wants in a husband. She wants him to be competent, powerful, and attentive. Competent, powerful, and attentive. That's what a lady wants. No lady likes a wimp for a man. You know, some ladies do like to domineer a man based on they had a, a mean dad or some, some bad experiences. But every, there, there are all kinds of studies on this. Women in general right now, when you take any survey, women are in general miserable right now. Because they've been lied to about who they are, what they need. What every woman wants is a competent, powerful, attentive man. Competent. What does that mean? It means he's got a clue on life. No lady wants to be married to a loser. Why? Because women need security. And if they don't get it from their husband, they can provide security for themselves. They're more than capable of providing for their own security. But they still have that need. And so, men, you need to be competent. You need to get 
your act together. You need to be competent in your job. You need to be competent as a father. You need to be competent as a spouse. You need to be competent as a citizen. You need to mow the grass. You need to paint the house. You need to make sure it's not leaking. You need to make sure that the sink works, the toilet flushes, and the garbage gets taken out. It's your job to care for those things. You need to be competent. When she turns the key... The car needs to start. That's your job. I know some of you drive Hondas, but in spite of that, (laughs) that's your job. That's your job. Now, are there ladies that enjoy auto mechanics and enjoy working on the house and mowing the grass? Yes, absolutely. I wish I were married to one of those. That would be wonderful. (laughs) I'm not saying that women can't do those things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is not their responsibility. It's your responsibility to care for that. You need to be competent. And then you need to be powerful. What is that? It's interesting. I was listening to a clinical psychologist talk about this. In every male interaction, there is the underlying threat of violence. If a man's talking to another man, he knows if I go too far, I'm going to get punched in the face. We don't even think about it, right? We don't even think about it, but we're always ready. It's there. Women don't think like that. They don't think like that at all. We are so different in the way that we interact. And so what a woman wants is a man who can care for her. And is powerful. Doesn't have anything to do with how big you are. I I tell Lydia that I'm a big man in a little man's body. (laughs) It's not talking about how big you are. That's not it. God determined what your size is going to be. That's not the issue. God wants you to be a strong, powerful man who knows what his plan is for life and sets out to accomplish it. That's what every woman wants. Do you know what that breeds? When a man is competent and powerful, that breeds respect in the wife. You see, every man wants respect. Don't talk to me that way. Wait, every man wants respect. If somebody gets in your face, you, you, know what? you, you really want to make a man mad, slap him. Right? That, that, guys, doesn't that bother you more than getting punched? Because it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. Every man dreams of being the hero. Every young man dreams of being the hero in a certain setting. The only place most men ever have the opportunity to be the hero is at home. Be the kind of man she can respect. And then, ladies, give him that respect that he needs. And then, do you know what can happen to that man? Then he can become the attentive man that you ladies need him to be. There are a lot of men who are competent and powerful, but they're completely oblivious of what their wife needs. See, I I honestly believe we've got some really competent and powerful men at Grace Baptist Church. I'm not in your homes. I don't know how you interact with your wife, but I promise you this, she needs more. She needs more attention. Uh, Someone said this. What guys do is we think of the grand gesture. I'm going to buy her a car. Right? I'm going to build her a garage. I'm going to put her in her kitchen cabinets or whatever. The grand gesture. Now, some of you ladies, yeah, I'd love some new kitchen cabinets or whatever. And, And, of course, you enjoy those things. You'd love a new car. Um. But what you would like even more than that is a note, a touch, a thoughtful comment every day and many times a day. See, men think in the grand gesture, I'm going to build her a castle. (laughs) Ladies think of the intimate gesture, and they think differently. 
Here, here's what the guy says. What do you mean I'm not attentive? I bought you a house. Yeah, 20 years ago. So husbands, competent, powerful, attentive. Dwell with them according to knowledge. What about ladies? Ladies, here's what, here's what your husband wants. Ready for this? Number one, he wants you to be attractive. He apparently thought you were when he married you. Men are very much controlled by the eye gate. And you worked hard before you were married. Your husband needs you to be attractive now. He needs you to be that. What will it take for you to do that? It might take exercise. It might take, you know, bondo. I don't know. <laughs> it, There's that boorishness coming out, right? Hey, if a barn needs paint, and paint it. Um, because here's what happens. He leaves you and you're not put together. And he goes to the little lady at the office who is. Guys, no excuse. Stay in control of yourself. Do right. But ladies, help your husband. And here's what you think. It shouldn't be that way. What's my answer? I ought to be 6'4". This is just reality. Men care about what their wives look like. It's important. It's important. So wives need to be attractive. And then you ready for this? Wives need to be competent. They need to be competent. L ladies, the house needs to be clean. The meals need to be good. That's your job. The Bible says that you are the keeper at home. Do a good job. Keep the children clean. Don't say things like, the children will potty train themselves. <laughs> yeah, when they're eight. <laughs> Amen? Competent. Do a good job. Understand what it takes to keep a house. Understand what your husband needs in the relationship. He needs for you to be attractive. He needs for you to be competent. And then he needs you to be attentive. He needs for you to be attentive. You need to meet his physical needs. He needs you to be attentive physically, emotionally. He needs you to build him up. Men get their self-worth from their job, what they do and they accomplish and from the woman that builds them up. It's so important. Ladies, tell your husband he's handsome. Tell your husband he's strong. You know, let him open the pickle jar. See, here's the thing. Some people think that's all silly. Man, every guy likes... Yeah, I got that. I got that. I might have to call Pastor Nathan to over to open it for me because I can't. But <laughs> Are you seeing a pattern here? Men and women are different. And we need each other. We need each other. God created Eve because it wasn't good that Adam was alone. The Bible says, He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It is so interesting. <laughs> women can live alone. Just fine. Guys are pretty pathetic. It's just true. Now, some guys can, but in general, when your wife goes away for a week, where's the pot holders? Um, where is that thing that you pour water through on pasta? Where is that thing? What is that? What's that called? What's that thing where, that, you, that you put cheese through? What is that? Where is it? Am I right, guys? Now, some guys are cooks, and I, I understand all of that. But women, we need you. And men, your wives need you to be that competent, strong hero for them. The other thing that ladies need to understand is when to leave their husband alone. There are times you want to talk and he doesn't. 
There's an old proverb, don't follow the caveman into the cave because you might find the dragon. You know, sometimes there's a problem going on and the wife wants to talk it through and the husband hasn't made a decision on it yet, doesn't even know what he thinks about it yet. But she wants him to tell her. And he doesn't know. And so you end up with, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know! (laughs) Has that ever happened? Ladies, men need alone time. When he comes home from work and all of the stress of... And I know many of you ladies work, but I'm talking about the way that men interact. He comes home from that job. When he walks in the door, that needs to be his haven. That needs to be his safe place. (laughs) A little snowflake. That needs to be his safe place. Yes, the problem has to be dealt with, but not at the door. Men, men also need man time. They need interaction with other men. You know, that doesn't go away. A lot of ladies don't need that. They, they want their girl time and whatever, but a lot of ladies don't need that. You need to allow your husband that time. But man, grow up. There's time to leave your buddies behind and go and be the husband that she needs you to be. Go and be the father that your children need you to be. So, husbands, competent, powerful, attentive. Wives, attractive, competent, and attentive. That's fundamentals. Then so, there's some boundaries that need to be established. Some boundaries. And I'm almost done. This, the, most of the message was that right there. I'm tired of families splitting up. There have to be boundaries in marriage. And here they are. Are you ready? Listen to this. Now, some of you ladies are going to get mad at me. But here, look at me in the face. There's something you need to see. I don't care. Okay, Because, listen, you're wrong. And some of you are being very, 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 very foolish. Some of you men are being very, 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 very foolish. Boundaries. Boundaries. Number one, men, don't talk to, email, Facebook friend women who are not your wife, sister, or daughter. Don't do it. Don't do it. Can can I just make a statement out loud? I hate Facebook. I hate Facebook. Preachers hate Facebook as much as doctors hate cancer. Because it's the same thing. And here's what's happening. I know there's there's some women out there right now. Because your life, where you ought to be attending to your family, is on Facebook. Some of you follow people. You know when their kids are picked up from school and what they had for dinner. You don't even know these people. They used to call that stalking. (laughs) Oh, I had this old boyfriend. Wonder what he's doing now. Oh, he's doing that. There's a picture of him without a shirt on. He still looks good. (laughs) Hi. And the next thing you know, the marriage is gone. Men, don't talk to women that aren't your wife. That doesn't mean you can't stand in the hall here and... You know, I'm talking to Carrie about Becca <laughs> falling and hurting, breaking her nose. And we're having that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about standard personal interaction that Christians do. What I'm saying is talking to a woman when her husband's not there. On the phone, email, texting, personal conversation. So men, don't talk to, email, Facebook friend, text, women that are not your wife, sister, or daughter. I wonder what the next point is. Women, don't talk to, email, Facebook friend, men who are not your husband, son, or brother. Stop it! 
It just breaks my heart to see homes destroyed because of ignorant behavior. Christians have no business behaving that way. See, what we're doing is we're bypassing 6,000 years of human existence. We're bypassing 6,000 years of boundaries. A woman was never allowed to be alone with someone that wasn't her husband. Ever! Men were never supposed to be in the company of a young girl that is not accompanied by her brother or her father or a family member. Those were the rules of polite society. Why is the rape culture growing? Those boundaries have been removed. You put college kids on a dorm floor. And the girls are going to the bathroom and getting ready in the shower with boys right next to them. And we wonder why there's trouble. Why are girls raped on campus? Because those boundaries have been removed. Men are animals. They need to be restrained. And they're restrained by a society that understands that men are animals. But men and women are different. If the children weren't here, I'd say more. But this is so very important that we understand this. We must establish boundaries in our homes. Ladies, if you find out that your husband's taking a business trip with a lady from work, you need to say no. Well, I might not get that promotion. Oh, well. Has it worked okay for Vice President Pence? Right? Um, So, let's go on. I know I sound mad. I am. Um, I hate what the the lowering of these boundaries has done to our homes. It's terrible. Can you write this down? Familiarity is the enemy. Familiarity is the enemy. See, it's almost impossible for me to have an affair with a woman that I never talked to. Is that fair? Is that fair? And counseling situations where people are vulnerable. Laura's with me in that setting. If, if a lady calls and there's an issue going on in their home or whatever, the first thing that happens after that, Laura, I just talked to so-and-so. Every time I talk to somebody, she's going to know about it. We have boundaries. We have rules. We want to be careful. So, boundaries. Familiarity is the enemy. So, fundamentals. Husbands are to be competent, powerful, and attentive. Wives are to be attractive, competent, and attentive. Boundaries. Men, don't talk to women that aren't your wife Uh, sister or daughter. Uh, Women don't talk to men that aren't your husband, uh, son, or brother. And then what about some goals? Let's let's put some some handles on this. Number one, competence. Um, I need to be better at all of my jobs. I I need to be a better husband. I need to care for the home better. I need to care for my responsibilities better. I want to be a better man next year than I am right now. Men, become more competent. Do better. Give her something to respect. Ladies, be more competent. Get some new recipes. Grow. Grow. Make the house, make the house a haven for your husband and your children. Make it peaceful. Become more competent. Then, powerful. Powerful. Men, take charge. Do what you're supposed to do. Be the man that God has created you and called you and empowered you to be. Do what it takes to get that done. Attractiveness. Ladies, work on your attractiveness. Work work on your attractiveness. And here's what, uh, you know, you'll ask the husband. So here's what's going to happen after church. Pastor said that I'm supposed to be attractive. Am I attractive to you? What's he going to (laughs) say? Well, been meaning to talk to you about this. There's this amazing invention. It's called a mirror. (laughs) Look around. Look at what's pretty. Look at what's fashionable in a holy way. Just become more attractive. 
then attentive. I need to be a more attentive husband. I need to be a more attentive father. I need to be a more attentive pastor. I want my attentiveness to grow. Um, Us guys, we're not touchy-feely. We're just not. That means it has to happen on purpose. I have to I have to care about you on purpose. Now, when you actually have a personal relationship with someone and you care about them, that comes naturally, right? But for the broader body of Christ, men, we have to do it on purpose. We need to become more attentive to our wives and more attentive to the people in our church. But here's this. Ready? Listen. listen. The ladies in your office don't need you to be more attentive to them. What do women want? Competence, power, and attentiveness. If you're good at your job and you're attentive to her, you're attractive to her. Don't be attentive to her. What's your name again? See what I'm talking about? I love your eyes. Come on. So, work on your attentiveness. Goals, competence, I want to be better at all my jobs. Power, men, take charge of what you're supposed to do. Attractiveness, ladies, work at it. Attentiveness, grow in it. And then boundaries. Establish and reinforce these boundaries because I don't want to see one more marriage go. Amen? Christianity 101. How many of you pretty much knew the stuff that I was talking about? Right? Fundamentals. It's fundamentals. Let's do right. Let's act right. Let's all stand together. Dear Heavenly Father.